<laughs> All right. Um, thanks so much, uh, Philippe, Alessandra, and Armin, uh, for these very inspiring uh, talks. I want to pick it up sort of where you left off, uh, Philippe. Um, you talked about Chile and you talked about gender equality. It wasn't a particularly rosy picture that you painted there. Uh, perhaps optimistic for the future, but uh, the description of the current state didn't sound too good. And I guess, you know, if you look at some of the data, uh, for example, the World Economic Forum has doing these rankings in terms of gender equality, and when you look at female labor force participation, it is indeed the case that Chile ranks in the bottom half. And if you look at, for example, equal pay for equal work, it's also towards yeah. the bottom half. So in that sense, there is sort of a big challenge there, I guess, uh, given your policy agenda. At the same time, there seems to be a success story right around the corner in the same country in Chile. If you, if you look at education, if you look at secondary education, tertiary education, actually World Economic Forum ranks Chile number one in the world. Uh, there is perfect gender equality on those dimensions. So I guess you have this success story on the, on the one hand, and you have this more negative picture on the other hand, is, are there some lessons in terms of, you know, that you can draw upon from the educational space that you can transfer sort of into the labor market space in terms of what policies that work, what policies yeah. that don't work, you know, given these sort of cultural uh, dimensions that you have to take into account? Yes, yeah, so first, I think um, in, in one of, there are probably two reasons why we have, we're lagging behind in, in gender equality in the labor market. One is cultural, so Chile, it is, uh, it was a very conservative uh, type of country, and now in the last 15 years, this thing is changing a lot. So the speed of change in terms of the values that we have among the new generation in Chile is amazingly, uh, ch changing amazingly fast. Um, so one is cultural, it used to be the case, and so that will probably take, and if you look at the same numbers, probably in 10 years it will change a lot. Mm -hmm. Exactly one of the reasons because of the uh, higher education system is really being able to uh, have equality among women and men. But the second one, we had a very stupid policy design in Chile, which was that if you hire women um, in, in, in a company, you have to pay childcare as, co as, 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 as a company. But if you hire a man, you don't have to pay a child car. So it was kind of very easy to fix. Uh, it's a very stupid policy we had in the last 30 years. So now we just fixed it last year. So that may change a lot the dynamics of, uh, of, of labor. And another thing is that actually now uh, we are also um, sharing the, 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 the time of taking care of the, of the children after they were born between fathers and, and, and mothers, and, and that's also something that is, is moving in the right direction. So, so I would say that probably there's a mixture between culture and bad policies that actually mm. is behind uh, these, these bad numbers in, in, in labor equality. Is there a simple explanation for the success story on the educational side in terms of um, cultural factors leading to this? Yeah, actually, we do ha did have a nice policy on that. We basically we opened the higher education system a lot. We we just said everybody who wants to run a university can do it, and they can participate with the same benefits as other ones. So as as a public school, as a public university. So it was a very open uh, to the to the market in a way uh, uh, higher education system. Now we are kind of doing some bad things. We were trying to restrict a little bit the, the freedom of that. I'm not a, in favor of that, but, um, but I think that is one of the biggest uh, reasons why we were able to really open higher education to everybody with a lot of grants. And now um, we move into a free higher education, which I think is a bad idea. Not because I don't like free higher education, it's just because it's so expensive. Now we are fixing prices. It's even the best universities are really complaining because they cannot hire the best teachers because they need to, since the, 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 the government fixed the prices, you cannot really go into research that much. So fixing, fixing prices is always a bad idea. And, and, and which is because of populist reason, we move into the free higher education. Um, and I think we didn't design the system very well. I do share the idea that everybody who wants to go to higher education should be able to go there. My perfect model would be you don't pay while you are studying free education while you're doing higher education, but then if you do well afterwards, you give back to the country a little bit. A little share of your, it's like a, of your of future income. In a way to, because we have low pensions, low pensions for elderly. So we are still a developing country. 
Um, so we're in the middle of the table. We don't have enough money to pay higher education for everybody. I don't think it's a good idea. All right. Very interesting. Um, now that we have a real-life politician here, I want to pick your brain a little bit following up on some of the data that Armin showed. And so think about the data that he showed on differences in patients across the world, right? And yeah. There was this strong correlation that the more patient, the richer the country is. Now, what I want to pick your brain on is, you know, thinking about different cultural contexts. You're operating in a particular cultural context. Think now about patients. So think about the patients of the voters, right? So I imagine that when you're thinking about difficult reforms, yeah. perhaps they are very costly today, but they may have some benefit in the future. Yeah. You know, the patience of the voters may come into account. Uh, yeah. Is that something that you actually have experienced? Some, you know, put bluntly, you would you know, say to yourself, geez, if people were only a bit more patient, then I could you know, push through with this reform. Something along those lines. I completely agree that this is a key component on, on the political debate. Um, for example, we were, I was very pro over-investing in child education, children's education, because actually our biggest problem is that in the first eight, 10 years, difference emerged and they stay the same. So inequality stayed the same after the year 10. Um, and we, I was, as a presidential candidate, I was really pushing that we should invest in children, children, children. And, but they don't vote, you know? Mm. They, they, they really don't vote. They, they, they will vote in, I don't know, 20 years. So um, it was very hard to convince, um, but, but, but at the end of the day, we were able to do it because of the narrative. And let me come back to the populist discussion we had before. Mm. At the end of the day, democracy is, 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 is a market where different stories compete because you want change, everybody wants change. So if you have the right story with, with deep roots in the right ideas, you will be able to win. And, and nowadays, the good thing is that we won the election, the president, not myself because I was running in the primary, Piñera won the election, I am working with him, and now putting the children first in the line is the main social reform we're doing. So we were able fighting, saying you're a populist, you're saying you have free higher education, which is obviously, you get a lot of votes, right? It's very easy but it's not the right thing to do. Mm. So at the end of the day, I am optimistic mm. that if you really work hard on your nar narrative about justice, you will be able to overcome impatience. Got it, very interesting, thank you. Uh, Alessandra, I wanna follow up on some of the work that you presented. Uh, you talked about the learning theory that you have sort of worked on now for quite some time and, and provided some evidence on this S-shaped relationship that we see over time in terms of the evolution of beliefs, the evolution of norms. You had survey evidence on this, and then, of course, in terms of outcomes as well, female labor force participation. And there is good evidence from multiple countries. The U.S., it, perhaps we have the best data from, but you have showed some more data from, from other countries that sort of goes in that, into that direction. And actually, if you look at the data from Chile, there seems to be sort of a, if you look at female labor force participation, it has really followed kind of this S-shaped curve. So it's, it's sort of a little bit of an optimistic view, I think, if we think that gender you know, equality or high female labor force participation is a good thing, and you can make a very good argument for that, not least from a GDP producing perspective, or GDP, a GDP increasing perspective. On the other hand, there are some global trends, I think, that maybe suggest that this isn't ne necessarily just a natural process that will happen over time at perhaps at different speeds. So you showed us the data. Well, I think you showed us the data on cross-country variation in female labor force participation. And it's, there's basically a very weak correlation with, with GDP per capita, mm -hmm. which suggests that there's something else going on than just development. Uh, if you look at global trends over time, uh, it seems like actually it's been stagnated at the global level. And if anything, maybe it decreased a little bit. It's sort of was slightly above 50% 10, 20 years ago, and now it's dipping below. Some particular countries like India, you see sharp downward trajectories in FLP. And so is that in contrast with the learning theory? How do you think about these sort of global patterns and these examples of successes versus, you know? Yeah, a couple of things about that. One is that um, if we look at the process of development and we look at women labor force participation, actually that is characterized by a U-shape behavior. 
That is, uh, what I showed you was like the last century. Mm-hmm. But going back in time, when, um, you know, countries like U.S. were, you know, start developing and where agriculture was uh, the, um, you know, the most important sector, then in that kind of uh, society, mm-hmm. women were working a lot. Mm-hmm. So... Um, it, it's true that it's not a monotonic, you know, linear relationship, right. uh, you know, across uh, development stages. So only if we look at the last part of the century, if we look at U.S. that has been industrialized, you know, in the last uh, eight years, but if instead they start looking at the countries like India or countries that are still in the developing stage, mm-hmm. then it's very important to look at the sectors that the country is in. Mm-hmm. So for a low development, a high agriculture kind of society, then women work a lot. And I think the reason is also because they can work and have their kids around at the same time. And then it's really with industrialization, with manufacturing, with the separation of work and the family place, the women sort of like uh, uh, stop working and had to choose and had to find a new way to organize, uh, you know, the family and the work at the same time and making them compatible again. And so that's why it took time, you know, to sort of like uh, uh, after, you know, this uh, decrease in labor force participation to go back up because mm. you needed the institutions, you need the right policies, you needed the belief that c- this could be done. So um, one thing that also I was um, um, thinking about is that as you progress and, and, and societies become more complex, then you also have a more heterogeneity and more possibility of differences, Mm-hmm. Right, so that also can explain why you can see that the differences may increase in, you know, in, in gender bias, simply because you have uh, uh, more heterogeneity and you have, you know, more possibilities to be different. Mm-hmm. If everybody is doing the same job and everybody is simply, you know, going get water and come back, or then it's it's hard to have, you know, large differences. But in a complex society where there are so many tasks that one, you know, needs to be doing, Mm -hmm. then there is more space and more room for uh, differences. And going um, and thinking about the more recent years and the flattening out of, uh, you know, the um, uh, labor force participation of women, I think that, I mean... uh, my impression is that there is a lot of extra emphasis now again on education because of the increase in the skill premium. Mm-hmm. And with education, it comes children. You know, like the time that we devote in, uh, you know, children's um, um, education is, has increased a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think that is also one of the, you know, the time is limited. <laughs> and so the requirements coming from family is actually probably increased over the last 20, 30 years as uh, skill premium has increased and we need to pay more attention to, um, you know, children again. And the only way out, I think, is again, you know, like a more equal gender roles. Mm -hmm. So if women and men can actually, and fathers and mothers are actually equally, you know, involved into uh, the family and the workplace, that is, you know, uh, probably the only way to make a society, you know, more gender equal. Yes. Got it. Very interesting. Thank you. I want to, finally, Armi, <coughs> Armi, I want to talk to you about, this This is actually related to the very last comment here. Uh, I found it quite striking, this evidence that you showed from around the world, where you have on the x-axis GDP per capita, or even the, perhaps, even more surprising, the gender equality on the x-axis and then on the y-axis you had um, differences in gender preferences. And you see this very positive relationship, at least after some, some time. Um, so I guess my big picture question to you, and I, I suspect you will have to speculate here, is what can explain this pattern, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it seems to me that there are at least two possible sort of explanations. One is that as countries grow, and perhaps new policies, more gender equal policies are implemented, differences start to diverge, right? So the the growth itself, say, causes differences in preferences, right? An alternative with sort of the flip side is, no, these are pretty fixed preferences that have existed for many, many years, gender differences that, yes, differ across, you know, localities and cultures and places, but they have, you know, have deep historical roots, 
And maybe what we see today is actually a consequence of those preferences, which is perhaps a more... Um, I don't know what's more plausible here, but that would suggest that gender differences in preferences can actually cause economic growth uh, and cause more gender equality, which is, you know, I think not an idea that is, you know, uh, standard theory, so to speak. So which of these two stories would you find more plausible? Is there any evidence that would point to one over the other, say, or is this not the right way to think about it at all? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> let me first point out uh, the effect of gender equality on these differences and the effect of economic development on these differences hold if we condition on either one, right? right? Yeah. So, because they are highly correlated. Mm. More, uh, richer countries are also more gender equal. There's a strong correlation. But even if you condition on either one, the correlations uh, are very robust and, and, and strong. I think there are actually two kind of competing hypotheses here, which we also address in the paper. One is that comes under the head of social role theory. And the idea here is that there are predetermined, very often male-dominated gender, role, uh, gender roles that women have to live up to, so to say. And then with more liberalization, with more gender equality, with voting rights, uh, cultural uh, and political resources, um, women can kind of get rid of these predefined male-dominated social role theories. This would actually suggest that differences get smaller. The other uh, hypothesis which we kind of find supported in the data is what we call the resource hypothesis. And the resource hypothesis uh, simply says it takes resources uh, to express and form idiosyncratic individual tastes, preferences and values which is suppressed if you don't have these resources, right? You can't live up to whoever you want to be. And these resources are economic resources, but they're also political or social and psychological resources. And with more gender equal societies, it just becomes possible to express individual desires, values, and preferences. Mm -hmm. uh, and in line with that hypothesis, uh, let me add a finding that we uh, haven't reported in the paper, but probably uh, will soon you can also slice the data in different dimensions, for example, by age. So not talking about gender differences, but differences, say, between the older part of the population and the younger part of the population, where we also find there are systematic effects. And again, the differences between old and young get larger mm. as countries get richer, for example. So in short, what I think we find supported is the idea that with more resources, you find more variability, generally speaking. If you allow people to express themselves they want to, as an outcome, you see more variability, more variation in, in, in that sense. And I think, therefore, it's important to say that there's a myth or misunderstanding in some sense that equality of opportunity, which I think is key, and you were alluding to this uh, quite forcefully, and I totally agree with that, uh, is important, but it doesn't necessarily imply that all people are the same, right? In fact, it could be exactly the opposite. So if I'm hearing both of you seem to have a similar message in that as economic opportunities are equalized across genders, we shouldn't expect equality of outcomes, or we shouldn't necessarily expect outcomes to start converging. You can have convergence in, in the preferences you measure, you can have convergence in occupational choices and so on. Is that a fair... Is that, is that a fair characterization? Of I, I think it's at least consistent with our yeah. data. <laughs> that's, very, that's very interesting. All right, so let's, uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, I'm going to open up the floor to you for questions, but let's first just quickly do the very last poll, the very last question to see if anybody's minds were changed. Uh, so let's, do the, let's skip this one and do uh, the very last question. Yes. So when policies, so please, oh, now maybe you need to, if you have the link up still, then you can vote. Uh, uh, so I'm going to, let's hope that you haven't been surfing the web during the talks, you still have the link up. So when policies uh, that improve gender equality are implemented in a country like Chile, would you expect the gender differences in willingness to take risk will be affected? So please vote now. Do, we have, do okay. we have an answer to that question? Exactly. <laughs> let's, let's see. Okay, let's look at the results. So. Is that a right answer? 
Yeah, so definitely a, a <laughs> substantial difference from before. Uh, I think number, uh, answer number D had about 14% uh, previously, and now it's up to 37%. That was before. That was before. Okay, that was, before. That was right. Okay, very good. Uh, so I guess some of you at least thought you, uh, your minds were uh, moved a little <laughs> bit, which is nice to see. Uh, so let's open up the floor for, for a couple of questions now. Satish Joshi, I work on uh, intercultural management. And my question is to Armin Falk. Thank you very much for such an exhaustive uh, studies which you showed. Did you consider a factor, as a cultural factor, what is called religion? Did you consider religion or a faith? Because I, I did not see anything on that. Yes. Thank you very much for the nice studies. But uh, I'm very much interested in that because, as you know, um, clash of civilization or Kampf that Kultur translated in German has been dealing with this. Mm -hmm. And Hofstede, who did the earlier job 50 years ago, they have like you, mm -hmm. he did not do that also as far as religion is concerned. And as, as you know, it's a very important factor in your or my behavior. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right away? Sure. Yeah. Uh, very good question. I uh, completely agree. Uh, we in one paper, which I'm happy to tell you about over coffee later, we actually relate the Hofstede measures with our measures and see whether there's uh, some overlap, etc. Uh, religion is a key uh, driver of preferences. Uh, as we re also report, let me just highlight one or two, uh, I thought, interesting facts. Within uh, Christianity, it's Protestants who are more patient, for example, uh, which you know, by and large, is in line with very famous hypotheses about, you know, Protestantism, pro, pro, you know, going back to Max Weber, etc. Uh, but worldwide, it seems that Jews are the most, uh, the, the most uh, patient subgroup when it comes to religious background. Uh, a caveat with our data, unfortunately, is we don't have individual religion in our data, but we can go by groups and, and uh, look at population samples, so to say. And then in Jewish communities, um, uh, they peak uh, when it comes to patients, for example. And if you, but we don't have the time, but if you think about how preferences form early in life, an issue that has been raised before, also in, 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 in your talk, uh, it's practices very often that, that, that shape our pre preferences. And if you think about learning the Talmud and you know, being extremely engaged in uh, particular practices, I think that makes perfect sense that that comes to... Um, um, that, that, that has uh, uh, consequences, for example, for the uh, formation of, of patients. Thank you. My name is Vinay Kalia. <clears throat> My, uh, uh, looking at the discussion that we had, I had a feeling that we have reduced the culture to very few parameters. And my assumption would be that a country like Singapore, for example, uh, doesn't have a single culture, but an uh, amalgamation of cultures. So everything, even if it's industrial, builds some kind of culture. And all the countries that you have referred to, uh, at some point in time, they had their moments of glory with the same culture. So Italy was with the Roman Empire, Greek Empire, uh, China. And then if you compare South Korea versus North Korea, same culture, but two different uh, options. So to me, it seemed Japan, um, did very well uh, with certain culture is now again down. So I think uh, aren't we putting too much value on culture and actually it should be something else which is driving because with the same culture we had different outcomes. What, one thing that I can say about that is that uh, looking at uh, you know, the kind of uh, uh, theory about networks is that, for example, having two forces like uh, epide epidemics as well as uh, uh, technology, it could be that a kind of network that was of a kind of social structure that was optimal, you know, some point in time, is not optimal anymore. That is, it could be that the society gets stuck somehow in, a, you know, in a social structure or in a culture that was uh, somehow uh, optimal, you know, uh, at some point in time, but then maybe is not well equipped, for example, to take advantage of uh, the new technology that comes around or the new innovation that come around. 
And culture is, uh, you know, slow moving for the most part. So it, it could be that there are times, in, and that can explain, right, the up and down, because it could be that something that is slow moving is not well equipped and cannot change fast enough to take advantage of new opportunities and new technology and new innovation that may happen fast. So that could be one explanation of why, you know, a culture and social structure may be important, but may be, you know, uh, not uh, changing at the same pace as um, uh, technology, for example. Let, let me add, if I may, very quickly, I think you're right. I mean, of course, culture is richer, and I also we, we shouldn't only look into a country as a unit of observation. And uh, with respect to the latter, uh, if you look at the correlation between patients and GDP, for example, this correlation not only holds between countries, but also within countries. So take the states in the US, the Bundesländer or the Kantone in, in, in Switzerland, for example, you find the exact same pattern if you take the regional GDP and uh, regional patients measures, for example. And what's interesting in terms of duration and um, um, uh, persistence of preferences or cultural values, I'm not proving anything here, but it's very suggestive in the following sense. Again, going back to the relation between patients and, and GDP, if you take measures of patients as of today, in 2012, where this data is coming from, and regress it on growth rates going back to the 19th century, going back to GDP in the 15th century, you get the same strong correlation. So you're right, there's fluctuation all over, but there also seems to be very long-run, deep determinants that are more or less favorable for economic development in the long run. I just wanted to mention that actually, uh, the way you frame the question is, is very much as, a, as if uh, culture is a fixed element. I don't think it's a fixed element. It's a, it gives you a base, so it's, it's very sticky in a way, but it's also actually is, is changing a lot. And if you look at the metaphor with the Mastil institution, so from culture, you could build institutions mm -hmm. that actually will protect you from populism or from doing wrong, following the wrong path. But I'm not saying that actually uh, culture is something that will by itself do all the job. So you need to, to always be worried about that your culture, my culture in Chile, your culture in Africa, your culture in Singapore, you need to find ways in a way that actually you can narrow the path that you could follow. You always be tempted to, to get in the wrong way, I think. The tensions in this political market are going to be always there as they are in the private market for investment banking. So here it's a very complicated industry, politics. So um, if you want to keep your country in the right track, you should take seriously culture, but also institution, and the, the interaction of both in order to keep it in, in the right track. In all of the examples you gave, it was a mixture between culture and institution that actually uh, give you the, the, the variation over time, right? All right, thanks so much. I think we have to wrap it up there. Uh, let me just say uh, a couple of words. There will be lunch served now, as far as I understand, it will be uh, over there. <clears throat> and then we will uh, uh, meet again at uh, 2 p.m. Um, we will talk about uh, culture within the business space and, and talk about uh, business success. But first and foremost, I want to thank the three of you for a very engaging discussion and fascinating talks. And I uh, hope you, everyone enjoyed, enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Thank you. So much.